Let's join together in our call to worship taken from our lectionary in the book of Ezekiel. The hand of God is upon us. We are brought out of the valley by the spirit of God. God's spirit is within us and we shall live. God will bring us to new life. No more can we say there is no life within us. For God has given us flesh and bones, spirit and life. In the spirit of life, let us worship God. Like the murmur of the dove's song, like the challenge of her flight, like the vigor of the wind's rush, like the new flame's eager might. Come, Holy Spirit, come. To the members of Christ's body, to the branches of the vine, to the church in faith assembled, to our midst as gift and sign. Come, Holy Spirit, With the healing of division, with the ceaseless voice of prayer, with the power of love and witness, with the peace beyond compare, come, Holy Spirit, come. Welcome to online worship at Birchcliff Bluffs United Church. While the doors are closed, we certainly are not. There are many things ongoing. Please check out our website at www.bbuc.ca. Whoever you are, however you identify, and wherever you come from, you are welcome here at Birchcliff Bluffs United Church. Please note that we have our Spring Fest online auction happening right now. There are lots of activities. There are lots of things that you can bid on. I encourage you to take a look. You can access the auction again through our website, www.bbuc.ca. You can also find links through our Facebook page. And I hope that you find something interesting that you might be looking for. Let's take time now in worship. As we prepare for worship, we take a moment to acknowledge the sacred land upon which we gather. It has been a site of human activity for many thousands of years. The land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Patoon First Nations, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Scugog. What we now know as Scarborough is part of the Williams Treaty lands, and I would encourage you to consider the place where you live, the space you inhabit, and learn about its care over the years. And today, the meeting place around Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful for the opportunity to live, to work on this territory. Now it's our time to share in the care and maintenance of the land, and part of that conversation is the work of reconciliation. And we seek to be mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. The four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, give us accounts of Jesus' ministry. And they differ because the various authors recorded the experiences that they had in their own time with their own understandings and wisdom that they bring to the world. Each recalls aspects of Jesus' ministry, crucifixion and resurrection, and the complexities of these stories reveal their challenge in understanding Jesus' teaching. So today is Pentecost Sunday, and we celebrate the gracious gift of the Holy Spirit who's with us now, who leads us in understanding the complexity of the world 
in seeing the light of Christ. Let it be an inspiration as the Spirit moves us in worship today. Let's join in our prayer for grace. Merciful God, we would rather stop your spirit when she leads us to unfamiliar places, people, ideas, and situations. We would rather choose how your spirit comes and receive the gifts we believe we deserve. Help us to remember that your spirit is a gift freely given to each of us for the common good. Help us to trust the Spirit's leading. Amen. Well, you mentioned Pentecost and people in church see red. Of course, not literally, but I'm not meaning that people are getting angry or anything, but most people identify the event of Pentecost with the color red. And it's a season that's more than just a color. It is rich in symbols. Pentecost is the 50th day after Easter, obviously a Greek word, penta. In an historic sense, it would have been the first harvest in the Middle East. Think of it like the time where we're cutting hay, for example. It's a time where Things are blooming and growing, and as you can see here, our red, flaming red coral bells are blooming here in the garden. I'm going to suggest that this celebration of the fruits and effects of the Spirit is what we're talking about with Pentecost. It's not really the birthday of the church. It is a birthing of new wisdom. and that new imagination that we engage with Pentecost is like baptism and confirmation in our United Church traditions. These symbols are nothing new to us in the church. We have candles, we have crosses, we have bread, we have wine, 
all of these things we have an idea that it conjures and there are several symbols within the Pentecost experience of course as well water flame dove wind breath and color now most of these are elements from nature and uh, as we celebrate from inside our computers we we sort of miss what's going on with that but I thought we could recapture that so I'm challenging you as part of your Pentecost experience to engage a little bit with these symbols you can see here that our columbine is blooming in the garden and from a water standpoint well you know the bees are starting back and the bees need water and i'm just gonna can't really do that in church but uh you can engage the water experience very nicely outside the wind and the breath well we're close to lake ontario and though there isn't much wind today if you were here you would feel and smell just a gentle breeze with the lovely scent of lilac happening of course we celebrated the flame earlier with the uh, lighting of the christ candle and we have the dove well i i couldn't you can certainly hear them the only evidence I have of the doves is the bird droppings right there. But nevertheless, you can hear the engagement that we have from the birds that fly, the dove descending. Each of those symbols represents something powerful about Pentecost and invites us into a conversation of wisdom, of newness, of new beginnings, and this Pentecost, take some time, breathe, slow down, take a deep breath in a time where breath is also a challenging understanding of our experience. Sit with your breath, sit with the spirit and engage Pentecost. And that's something completely different for today. together as we listen to God's word this day. Help us, O oh God, to come to you 
with open lives to receive your words. May we give them new life as we listen to what you have to say. May we be fired by the Spirit to open our hearts as we embark on this journey with each other and with you. Amen. Our first reading is an account from the Gospel of John that shares a vision for the work of the Holy Spirit. When the advocates come, whom I will send to you from God, the Spirit of truth who comes from God, they will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning, so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to the one who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send them to you. And when they come, they will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to God and you will see me no longer about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned, I will still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. When the spirit of the truth comes, they will guide you into all the truth, for they will not speak on their own, but will speak whatever they hear and will declare to you the things that are to come. They will glorify me because they will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that God has is mine. For this reason, I said, they will take what is mine and declare it to you. Our second reading is the Pentecost story that marks the spark of the church. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak another language as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from each nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Metis, Amites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judah and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phragmites and Pamphylites, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and Tophites, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deed of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, ha, They're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. People of Judea, all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your children shall prophesy, and your young people shall see visions, and your elders shall dream dreams. Upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood, and fire and smoky mist. 
The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of God's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of God shall be saved. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we enter into a time of conversation, let's share in prayer. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts cause us to be stirred by your powerful spirit, to feel the presence through wind, through nature, as we embrace the spirit in service to the world. I, uh, I was rummaging through the vestry at Emmanuel College a few years ago as I was preparing for a worship service. It's one of my favorite places at the college and it's a fascinating room full of everything you could ever imagine using to augment a service. Candles, communion sets, music, vestments, banners. The, the last one is what I'd like to talk about. Uh, the churchy names for banners and the like are paraments liturgical and ecclesiastical hangings and adornments. Emmanuel has tons of them, some gifts from graduating classes, but the vast majority hand-me-downs and some are quite lovely. I say some. Amongst the beautiful altar cloths, I found one that really stood out. It was a bright red set with an image of a descending dove with completely bugged out eyes and huge claws that looked like they were from a velociraptor. It's a true story. Uh, this is a moment where I really wish that COVID did not prohibit me from going to the college. There would be a, a great picture, uh, if not the real thing, maybe for today's service. At the time, I showed the cloth to a friend of mine and the response was, well, we can't use this one. It makes the Holy Spirit look really dangerous. Now, in retrospect, that's an interesting comment and maybe some, some good advice there too. But we often hear Pentecost described as the birthday of the church and, well, true in some ways, uh, but that seems a bit mild and it, it does seem a little sentimental to me. The story is really anything uh, but quaint. It actually is a dangerous story. The story begins, as does much of this part of the New Testament, with a small group of people huddled together, isolated, feeling separated, it seems, from what was happening outside in the world around them. And the text tells us they were all together in one place. I, I can see that. After all that has happened, they might have been afraid of the unknown, afraid of outsiders. So they all stayed together. Had they actually known better, they would have been afraid of not dispersing, perhaps, because what was about to happen would have freaked out even the bravest of us. They were in danger, but not from outsiders. The danger they were in, as they all sat together in one place, was from a God who's about to crash their party and bring along everyone that this little group was trying to avoid. Then things get out of control, right? With the wind and the voices and the language and the fire and all of that. It can feel like all that bizarre activity that it happened that Pentecost day in first century Palestine has little resemblance to what the church has become in 21st century Western society. There were no organs or spring fest committees or pie day events. At the so-called birth of the church, there were no ushers handing the Parthians a bulletin. The Medes didn't have a bake sale after the service. It can be hard to see any resemblance at all from how we started to what we've become. Well, unless we look at the people, in which case there's really no difference whatsoever. 
We still have fear and isolation in the church. We still huddle together, fearful of the outsider. We call it sectarianism now, so nothing's really changed there. And those people who did all the speaking in tongues bit, well, obviously we think that they're all the Pentecostals. The long list of how many different nationalities that showed up must have been added by an early general council, the United Church, bragging about their multiculturalism. Well, nothing's changed there either. Then there were those who witnessed this powerful act of God. A friend of mine calls it Pentecaos. I've heard that term. I mean, Google it. You can see people talk about this. And in an attempt at intellectualizing it all, people have said, well, what, what might this mean? How does this inform our understanding of God? So clearly they were a minister. And the people who said, those people are drunk, well, perhaps they're the morality police focusing on dictating what other people are allowed to do at any given point in time. So that's not changed a lot either. And then, of course, at the end, there are those who just want everyone to get along, to be nice. The naive person who says, well, golly gee, there's no way they can be drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. They were the clear vestiges of our Methodist tradition. Nothing's really changed much. People are people. There are the emotional ones, the judgmental ones, the naive ones, and of course, the ones like myself who insist on categorizing and naming everyone as though people can simply be reduced to a label, honestly. So there we all are, even from the beginning. Flawed, smug, confused, embarrassed, and embarrassing. In other words, we are the very people to whom God sends the Spirit. And we're embarrassed by that Spirit. That's why that altar hanging really should be an image here this morning. The bright red one with a bug-eyed velociraptor dove. It is actually a more appropriate image than the Hallmark card dove that we often see gently hovering in a watercolor sky. You know it because I've used that image too. I get it. We try to make sense of things and so we revert to spiritual metaphors of comforter and the, the dove and the wind help us with this. But the thing to remember is that the Holy Spirit is not a metaphor because she'll mess you up and metaphors don't do that. Because the Spirit, while called the Comforter, does not bring warm milk and cookies with a nighty-night story. It is not that kind of comfort. The Spirit brings the comfort of the truth. And if you're like me, experiences of finding truth are not usually what I would call cozy experiences. For the United Church of Canada, it has not felt cozy with the demographic shifts that are happening around it and within it. And there's always been differences between churches. Try Timothy Eaton Memorial on a Sunday morning and then hop on down the street to Trinity St. Paul's near U of T for the next event. For some observers, the United Church is all Birkenstocks and NDP voters, and for others, well, we're, we're just heathen. It sure didn't feel cozy when the United Church was called out on the idea of reconciliation. It has been a painful, difficult road to begin reconciliation. And it sure didn't feel cozy when the United Church struggled with the ordination of gays and lesbians, now even 30 years ago. There's still rifts from that time. And it sure didn't feel cozy when the United Church realized that its systems and structures were not and continue not to be welcoming to black communities or to people of diverse cultural backgrounds. I heard a wonderful story from Nadia Bowles Weber. Nadia is a minister who founded the House of Sinners Church in Denver. And where some churches might fear drag queens or homeless folk, the House of Sinners downtown church suddenly started to have all these white, middle-class folk driving in from the burbs, you know, wearing dockers and having dinner at Eastside Mario's. She started to resent that her independent boutique church was becoming too mainstream. And then the marginalized, edgy folks that 
had always been attracted would now come and see a bunch of people who looked like their parents and think, oh, wow, well, this obviously isn't for me. So she, in her instance, called a church meeting to talk about the growth and the demographic changes with the hope that once these new people figured out who they were really sitting at the table with, that they would realize it's really these new people who don't belong there and they'd self-select out the door and realize that it wasn't meant for them. Interestingly, before that meeting happened, Nadia had called a friend who she expected would sympathize with her, but the friend refused to cooperate. And this is the, the statement from her friend. Yeah, that sucks, they said. You guys are really good at welcoming the stranger that looks like your mom or dad. But, oh, sorry. You guys are really good at welcoming the stranger when it's a young transgender person. But if the stranger looks like your mom or dad, well, that's a problem. She said that she wanted to hold the phone away from her ear and yell, you're supposed to be my friend, and then hang up on them. But she couldn't because that was the moment where the bug-eyed velociraptor dove, that spirit, got a hold of her. And she saw the truth. And she saw that her friend spoke truth. And that was, for her, the work of the spirit. Well, for us here at Birchcliffe Bluffs United Church, I'm going to challenge you to let the bug-eyed velociraptor dove join the party. What corner are we huddling in because we fear who or what might be around that corner? What plate of warm milk and cookies are we trying to cozy up to? Because there are things about us that if we take a good hard look, we might realize for all our big talk that we're not welcoming, that we don't make it easy for others to come to us together with us in this space. The spirit is here to take our stony hearts, our fearful hearts, and to make them something new. Because in these moments, there we all are. All of us were flawed, smug, confused, embarrassed, and embarrassing. And remember, in other words, we are the very people to whom God sends the Spirit to mess things up. We are the very people God loves enough to send that bug-eyed velociraptor dove to come to snatch our stony hearts, our fearful hearts, and replace them with the comfort of God's own. Because God hasn't changed. Just like that first Pentecost, God still crashes the party and invites in exactly the people that we're trying to avoid. God still says yes to our very polite, very Canadian, uh, no thank you. That's the thing that the Pentecost spirit of truth is about. It's embarrassing and we don't want to hear it. And it feels like the truth might crush us. And sometimes it does. But when that happens, the Spirit is there, helping us back together to create something real, perhaps even for the first time. For the Spirit, there is no other. This bug-eyed velociraptor spirit is a radical, mysterious, and dangerous thing. This embarrassing spirit is calling us to come together to form the body of Christ, sometimes despite us, sometimes seemingly against us, but always for us. Because it is only the Spirit that can turn us from a they into a we. Thanks be to God. Break the bread when a hungry child.
the love that Christ revealed Living in a world, getting in a world Still the Spirit leads the fight Seeing wrong and setting right God in Christ has come to stay We come offering gifts. Come Holy Spirit, set our hearts on fire. Find the passion that you have placed in our lives and let it become the fire of transformation that refreshes, that refills, that renews, not just for us, but so that we might join with others to live God's love a love that transforms the world. And as Christ's Pentecost people, we offer our gifts with generous spirits, the gifts of our hands, our time, and our hearts for the loving transformation of this world. Hallelujah. Let's share our offering. Let's join together in prayer. God, we live in a world that does not listen for the Spirit. We live in a world that's troubled, a world of terrorism, sexism, and racism, a world of fear, scarcity, and violence, a world of abuse, addiction, and abandonment. The Spirit directs us to love others as you love us. We pray for the courage to show others we love them. The Spirit reminds us that the world will not understand us. We pray for the integrity to defy the world's values. The Holy Spirit implores us to give unselfishly, and we pray for the strength to deny ourselves for the good of others. The Spirit is God's presence in us, and we are God's presence in the world. May we bring God's peace and comfort to those who are sick in hospital, to those who are mourning loss, to those who are lonely or depressed, to those that we name aloud or in our hearts now. May others know we are disciples of Jesus by our love of our neighbor. May we offer God's love, compassion, and grace to all people. And may the Holy Spirit inspire us to live Christ's commandments as we share together the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Spirit, Spirit of gentleness, flow through the wilderness, calling and free. 
spirits spirit of restlessness stir me from placidness wind wind on the sea you moved on the waters you called to the deep then you coaxed up the mountains from the valleys of sleep and over the eons you call to each thing wake from your slumbers and rise on your wings spirits spirit of gentleness flow through the wilderness calling and free spirits spirit of restlessness stir me from placidness wind wind on the sea you sang in a stable you cried from a hill then you whispered in silence when the whole world was still and down in the city you called once again when you blew through your people on the rush of the wind spirit spirit of gentleness blow through the wilderness calling and free Spirit, spirit of restlessness, stir me from placidness, wind, wind on the sea. You call from tomorrow, you break ancient schemes, from the bondage of sorrow, the captive and dream. Our women see visions, our men clear their eyes with bold new decisions. Your people arise. Spirit, spirit of gentleness, blow through the wilderness, calling and free. Spirit, spirit of restlessness, stir me from placidness, wind, wind on the sea. Empowered by the word and the story, we go to be God's people in the world, encouraged by the past, beckoned by the future, we claim our place as teachers and learners, accompanied by the creator and the creating, by the great embarrassing spirit of God. We go with confidence and with grace. Come Holy Spirit, set our hearts on fire as we go forth today and forevermore. Amen.